And a very big warm welcome to the Bar Stewards Inquiry Sunday Sermon. My name's Lee Keyes of systembet.co.uk and as always my partner in crime is John Leng of John Joe's Blogspot who is bouncing today after uh, backing a few winners and tipping a few winners and uh, we're all rather happy today on the uh, on the Sunday Sermon. John, tell me about your week this week. Big Craven meeting, we've had, the, we've had all the trials, tell our listeners um, how you've done and what 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 you found this week? Yeah, well, I spent most of the most of the time when Newmarket was on doing it in actually. Um, <laughs> yes. I, uh, I I was having to think about it actually earlier today, and I thought, well, my highlights from the Craven mate, and well, I think getting out in one piece was probably one of them. Um, <laughs> I didn't really think I saw anything that would ruin in a classic. To be honest. Um, mm. there, was, there was nothing really took me breath away at the uh, at, at the Craven meeting. Um, I thought by far the most impressive performance was uh, your horse to follow in the opener today. Oh, the yeah, the uh, Philly, the, the, the lovely grey Philly. Yeah, Snow Lantern, what a performance. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely loved, loved it. You know, I mean, she took enough of a tug early on. Um, Looked for all the world as, as though she'd get 10 for her long, was no problem, I thought. Um, it's early days, but I mean, I, I think I prefer it to her mother. It's interesting that, I mean, to be fair to Richard Annan Jr., he did he did say he thought, he thought she could end up better than her mother. Um, and she, I mean, she, I agree what you say, actually. I bet they're in a bit of a quandary now, because they're probably watching that and thinking, uh, this could be uh, Musidora. Um, or or or, so, or or going the going the ten route because, the, but then there's only one guineas and you know it, it's but like you say she she looked she looked pretty this way you would you wouldn't want to run in maybe at seven would you? No. Um, then again, a flat gallop at seven. I'm, I'm not really uh, Yeah. I um I'd be wary of a music daughter because it often cuts up. Yeah. And I think I think she would want a gallop to run at over distance beyond the mile. I wouldn't want her to say in a tactical heat. Not yet, anyway, because I think that lack of experience might tell. Mm. Um, plus, physically, I wouldn't say she looks a man and a half as physically. You know, I mean, she's got a rare backside on her. Uh, That's why I thought real big back end. Yeah, um, you know, she looks a, a real powerful miler. To me, yeah. um, from a physical point of view, um, well, I, I couldn't have been more impressed with it today, really. I mean, I think there's no question that's probably the best maiden we'll say run this year, three, three-year-old maiden, because um, I think the the Gosden house is quite tidy, and I think the third house is there, right? Yeah, Gosden's also half brother to enable, um, and pulled very hard on debut, pulled hard again, and. And he's got to settle down. If he's going to fulfil the potential, what he probably could have, he's got to start start dropping it. But I'm told he's 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 very keen in his work uh, from day one, really. So I, I don't. They've got a bit of a quandary there because obviously he's bred to go further, but you can't carry on pulling like that up in trip and you know down in trip doesn't really suit on pedigree. Um, so. They've, they've got some work to do with him, but but like you say, he, he does look a good prospect. So mm-hmm. hopefully they can get it right on the, uh, you know, pulling harder than Boris Johnson sticks. I think right. the Agassiz that won the John Carter as well. I think that's an improved animal this year. Yeah, he, that that was a, to be, to be fair. It, it, I thought it was a good ride as well today from, yeah. from Jim. He, he got it switched off and. He, he was fortunate that they, in a way that they went a good pace, good swinging pace, and you can Glenn took on um, uh, Tyson Fury and the, and the yeah. <laughs> rumble rumble of the jungle, and um, and then down the outside Jim came, like I say, straightforward ride, uncomplicated, but but did did the right things on him. But I do like you. I think he can be definitely uh, Group One this season over over middle distances. Yeah, um, I, I, do, yards, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, w- I would imagine 
what 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 would you say early? What would you say before that? Do you think? Do you think maybe coronation cup perhaps? Well, if it didn't come so quick, maybe jockey club stakes at the Guinness Main. Yeah. Um, coronation cup. I don't know. I mean, I I don't like Epsom. I mean, it, it breaks horses down, but sometimes the coronation cup's easy, isn't it? You know, because everybody doesn't like Epsom, so you, yeah. you know you could go there and end up with a lap of honour. Um. So you 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 couldn't blame I guess if you went down that route. Um, but I I thought initially maybe look at the jockey club stakes uh, at the guineas right and then like take it from there. I've got to say, every year, year on year, uh, Willie Agus, the trainer, just keeps on impressing me. Um, he, he just uh, the the way he manages the horse. I think I think uh, he's got a plan at the end of it with some of them. He seems to. Uh, with that, he knows what which ones need to be handicapped. He, know, he knows where every, every horse needs to be. And I, I, I full kudos to, to William Agus as a trainer. Really, really thoroughly think he's he's the man. Really, John Gosden. Obviously, everyone says he's the man, but I, I'm, I'm a William Agus fan. Here we go. There we go. Yeah. John Nolan. Same in town. We 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 just never fail. Oh, this is brilliant. I well, mean, anyway. uh, I guess, like, he's got a good right hand there as well. Yeah. You know what I mean, Piggott? Yeah. You know, I think they work very, very well together. Yes. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. I mean, right. Yeah. On to the questions. We've only got so long. We could talk forever on this. But uh, we've got a couple of list of questions, and the first one is from Carl Swanson, who's a, a regular listener, and he says, should we start a petition to get rid of Jason Weaver? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I just don't know what you thought. I don't, I don't mind him. But... Well, 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 to, well, to, to what extent do we want rid of him? Do we want him off the telly? Uh, off the, the planet? Team? Well, you know. Um... You know, you know uh, like prob- probably like, in, 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 sort of like in tune next to Latifah or something, Princess Latifah. <laughs> Well, it maybe wouldn't be a bad thing, uh, to be honest. Uh, I mean, he, he's, he's all right in small doses. I mean, I can listen to him for about 20 minutes, but then I have to go and do something else, you know. Um, he, he always, I always think if he wasn't a racing pundit, he could get a job as the, uh, the Green Cross Cord man. Because every every sentence he starts with "look," <laughs> and I, I'm looking out to see if there's a car coming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes you think, "Oh, that was an interesting thought." You maybe say something about riding in a race and that, you know, and you think, "Well, yeah, maybe I hadn't considered that." And then you think about it for a couple of minutes, and you realise you had. You know, yeah. it's just your man playing tricks on you. He doesn't bring anything new to the table, does he? Yeah, like so many, really. Uh, I mean, it's it's just one of those things. It's like you said. What, what was the? <laughs> you said something funny once. It was a. It was about uh, racing pundits and the criteria for uh, for getting a job as a, as a racing pundit. You had some. You had to either fall off an horse. <laughs> well, you probably have to throw off the horse and eat your head, definitely. Uh, you know, so, so you were actually struggling to string a sentence together. And, um, uh, no, I mean, they're, they're, not, the they're most... not good, these no. jockeys, are they? I mean, the only one, really, that's cut the mustard is Walsh. You know, he, I, 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 he's brilliant, he's outstanding. Yeah. And doesn't it show though? You know, I mean, he, he could have been ordinary and looked outstanding yeah. against this lot. You know, I mean, Ruby Walsh against George Baker. You know, well, Baker would have you sticking pins in your own eyes, wouldn't he? <laughs> Who's the biggest smoke blower then? Uh, Baker or Tyler Kay? Well, Ty Licky's pretty that. I mean, they'd all have to go. Some I, 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 
you know, I mean, Dale Gibson was the, the king of the small, wasn't he? I mean, you know, he had not, there was, there was more smoke signals than you had any more. The skull. The oh. skull head. Yeah. I mean, he, he actually sat there and he said, I will never criticise a senior jockey. Yeah. Which should have got him his matching order straight away. You know, um, I'm, I'm, saying, ba- I'm saying Baker. I'm saying Baker more than, more than Ironside, I think. Yeah, well, he, he, he's been quiet inside lately and he's been busy with his legal team. So. <laughs> Taking on the funky given. Uh, the yeah. Well, it might it might lead to de- um, the funky given getting the job as a pundit if he has a big bill to pay. So I hope he turns up like Oliver Reed on Terry Wood. I, I know, I said, he'd make a bit of good viewing with uh, the other, wouldn't he? <laughs> he just uh, rocked up there, you know, unprepared. <laughs> Bleary red eyes and you know slurring. Yeah, that's what I, we need. I can watch that. <laughs> right, second and final question this week is from Beachy Head and a regular listener and a good Twitter follower. And he says he's he's been incredibly impressed with the start Ryan Moore has made to this flat campaign. Obviously, Ryan was going for the five timer uh, on Saturday and failed narrowly uh, by one ride to get that, got four-timer up. He said he was excellent on broom, single-handedly got that home, said BG Ed. What do you think, John? He's had in our race. You know, uh, I think he has had a couple of years where he's it's been very indecisive, I think. Uh, yeah. You know, um, it's, it's like he's been sat waiting for that. Um, blueprint ride to come along where they can just drop in and come wide into the street and pick them up, you know, uh, as the pace collapses. And that was all he was looking for for, for quite some time, I thought, you know, it was a terrible year. Um, he just seemed a bit more proactive at the minute. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe somebody's had a word, I don't know. Well, I looked at his stats on what Beachy had said, and you know, just to check this out. Yeah. Sometimes, every time I like back jockeys, and I think, God, you, you're a plus. And then I'll check the actual stats of the actual yeah. and expect expected wins, and it turns out that they're not as a plus as I'm saying. Now, yeah. in the case in the case of Ryan Moore, for the last two seasons, anyway, prior to this one. Yeah. He's been very poor. He's, he's, he's actual is is actually lower than the expected. So mm. in other words, he's, he's not riding as many wins as he should, which for a jockey with the kind of mounts he gets yeah. is is not very good. So I think he has been in a bit of a weird place, Ryan Moore, for, for, for a while, possibly over bet by the, by the public yeah. sometimes because people are expecting the, the wow factor. And I, I don't think Ryan's ever had the wow factor. So I think it's just the case of that if you unless it's wow, his name miserable. <laughs> he's good say he's very miserable, isn't it? yeah. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I can't name him on air, but but I know some um, pundits that that work, you know, for ATR and and stuff, and and they've not got much many good things to say about him. He's he's a, he's a very uh, very private man, but a difficult man to to to, to get to say anything, in, which. Uh, some people are like that, and I, I get that. But I, I just, you know, I mean, geez, you know, he's is, he's is old stone face. He'd be a good poker player, Ryan. Do you think? He probably would. Yeah. yeah. Um, espionage might be his business. As long as he'd be good at, you know, he'd send yeah. him over to Russia or something and start building him. <laughs> Yeah, that cold stare of Ryan Moore. Uh, right, <laughs> on, on to the week's topics. And it was quite refreshing this week, I felt, in the news this week. We had Charlie Mann. Cracking pair of trousers Charlie uh, sported all these years. 
And very sad to see him retire this week. And they had his final runner today, which they backed into favourite. And it, it basically ran like some of our bets in the Craven meeting. And poor Charlie couldn't go out on a winner. But Charlie had his final say. He couldn't wait to get that lot out in the racing post this week. And Charlie was vehemently uh, critical of, of the BHA, uh, calling them absolute idiots. You know, complete, you know, and we, I don't think we can really argue with that, can we, uh, in, in terms of criticism of the BHA. You went on also to say about that there should be stable caps in terms of stable numbers to, to sort racing out. And he absolutely loves bookmakers. John? He, uh, he, he lanced the boil with a pickaxe, didn't he? Uh, really. yeah. I mean... Uh... It was refreshing, but again, why do they have to wait until they're leaving the game to speak up? Yeah, that's what I thought. You I know, thought, I thought, I mean, fine. while you're in the game, everybody's mad, aren't they? You know? Yeah. yeah. And the, the minute you're putting your cards in, oh, he's, 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 he's hopeless. <laughs> this lot, we're not going to deal with these. It's terrible. The game's not good. It's their fault. Why don't they speak up while they're in the game? And you got a chance exactly. of getting something done about it, you know? Exactly. That's a very yeah. good point. I mean, it was on the board of the National Trainers Federation and someone, wasn't he? And Rafe, right, Ralph, yeah. Rafe, Ralph, Rafe, Rafe rang him up and <laughs> told him he was sacked. And he was pleased. Well, again, that's a failure on his part. Because if he was on the board of the MTF, he was in a position to make some waves. But he's chosen not to. He's selling a hide a wind operation or something like that and sneak him <laughs> out like a little hat. Yeah, just, you know. just, just, for our, just for our listeners, that Char, Char, <clears throat> if you haven't read the Racing Post article, Charlie Mann basically said he'd, give, he'd given horses five wind ops, five, five different horses wind ops, uh, and he'd only declared one of them. Um, and, and so he was like saying a, a big a big fingers up, you know, F you to the, to the authorities on that one. I did like, I, I did like his comments on the BHA. He goes, you know, a bunch of, idi- a bunch of idiots in one of the most expensive properties in London. <laughs> you know? Well, that's absolutely true. I mean, <laughs> It's outrageous, you know. I mean, it comes back to everything we say about the sport needing rationalising, you know. I mean, mm. you've got the jockey club rooms, and Christ knows what it must be worth, what's on the walls in there. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, why? Yeah. Bit, harsh, bit, harsh, bit harsh from Charlie there to say to go to Milton Keynes there. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd want to go there, to be honest. <coughs> he, well, he, 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 yeah. As long as you don't get referred, you wouldn't have to go. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it, yeah. Yes, yes. Keep, out, know, keep out of trouble. It's a, it's a, bit, a bit of discouragement, isn't it? You know, it's all very proactive, you know. You, you would have your um, your panel sitting where nobody wants to go anywhere near. So, so finally then, on Charlie Trousers... Let's uh, discuss what he thinks about bookmakers. He, he, he thinks there's a scourge, and he, and he said they should have nothing to do with sponsoring yards or sponsoring jockeys or or getting the fingers and toes into pies, you know, of racing establishments. What do you think for that? Well, you can't blame the bookmakers for it because the BH actively encourage all this. They actively encourage it people in the spot to get involved with them. If anybody says anything, they say they don't see anything wrong in it. You know, I mean, it might not happen in the next year, but I would say in the next five years, you will see a jockey seriously assaulted on a race course in this country. Seriously assaulted. Because of these tenuous links with vote makers because somebody somewhere will be riding the last leg of a lucky 15, lucky 31, and somebody will have had it on with the firm where he's the ambassador or whatever you call them. <laughs> He'll ride a stinker 
and that will be it. The balloon will go. And it's such a glaringly obvious conflict that's waiting to happen. I, ju I just can't believe that racing haven't stamped on this from the start. You know. I, I, I completely agree with you on this. Uh, it, it is remarkable how it's allowed to continue. And I don't blame the jockeys or whatever for taking a bit of cash. Um, I, but like you say, it needs regulating, and for me, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't sit comfortable with it at all. Uh, from a, from a, squarely with the BHA. Yeah. No so, fault of the bookmakers, no fault of the jockeys. They are just making a few quid and rocking along as they want to do. Yeah. Um, they aren't there to regulate the sport. The BHA, are. and it, once again, woefully negligent. Yes. Yeah. Can't, can't disagree with anything you said there. Right, we move on to our second topic, which is uh, Japan. And uh, they kill things that we like, which, you know, goes off, but there we go. They, but, don't, they don't actually kill some of them. I've, I've had some Japanese film that was still moving one. <laughs> it's still alive. Uh, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. unsettling. Yeah. Well, but anyway. I mean, the, the rise of Japan, basically. Um, it, it, online, because of what, what's been happening last year with COVID, Japan betting turnover has been $8.4 billion. I mean, that, that is just astounding. And apparently, the reports are that, that a lot of the money is obviously going into it, back, back into racing and, you know, and obviously funding the facilities, help, you know, basically just building the game. Now, again, the, the, I know that our, our punters wouldn't want particularly their model of getting shafted by a 30% tote to, you know, to, 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 to have to play the game. But it has its upside. I mean, it's 66 pence, John, to get in a Japanese race course. Yeah, it's a bit dear, isn't it? <laughs> uh... Do you, do, you, do you still climb over the walls at the local? No, I just walk in now. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There'll be some old duffer on on, 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 on a turnstile. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you, 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 just, you, just, you just show, aye, aye. <laughs> We've got a second bout of sirens. Uh, yeah. uh, John I, can't, I can't remember the last time I played at the local, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah. I really can't. I can't. I can't. I don't want to pay. I wouldn't want to pay. I, um, I wouldn't go. Yeah. To be honest, um, you know, I mean, the grub's overpriced and rotten, and I'm not just talking about the local. Eh? I mean, I think everywhere. It, it yeah. is. I mean, this is this is the thing, though, right? So you you you're getting. This is kind of weird. we we feel like in alternate universes where one country like like ours, you, you know, punters are getting banned from bookmakers for showing any kind of bit of form. Can't get a bet on. Um, uh, you know, it, yeah. there's lots of prob problems for punters having bets. They're on about affordability checks. On about you know this and this this and till the you know ooh don't, don't get don't get too heavily involved in gambling. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're at Japs. You know, flying away. You know, eight and a half billion dollars going going into tilt. I mean, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, we're going backwards, and 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 basically, you've only got to look at the at the uh, at the prize money, the, the 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 level of race planning where we're getting five and six meetings a day, where we can't, you know, we're racing for peanuts. I mean, the the prize money at Nubu is disgusting. And uh, including new market as well, and I just think, what on earth? I mean, who are running this sport? I mean, just, it, just everything about it's apparently wrong. Isn't it? It's just nothing makes sense. Do you agree? It, well, I mean, you, you just trace everything back to that incredibly expensive property at Idlebourne, and <laughs> you go in there, and there'll be thirty to forty gibbering gimps trying to organise this sport. And they just literally haven't got a clue where to start. 
because yeah. it needs tearing down and rebuilding from scratch. And they haven't got the absolute foggiest where to start. And that is the damnable misery of it. They have no respect for the game. They have no love for the game. The only thing that they love is the pension and the salary and possibly the car. Yeah. And that's it. Otherwise, you wouldn't get brown pot ideas like the Shergar Cup coming to save the game. Brands and things like that, you know. I mean, yeah, People, exactly. You know, exactly, yeah. They think they can save the game by an extra twenty percent of people going to a Friday night meeting and everybody buying a solid ice cream. And all that benefits from that really are the tracks. Of course. You know, this is the other thing, right? There's too many people with fingers in pies that are taking money out right, left, and centre. Yeah. But it's not, it's not getting fed back into the sport. Um, no, because they show no inclination into embracing the fact that it's a sport based on gambling. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're lucky if you can get a bet on it. <laughs> to to yeah. get your information that you need to bet, you need to pay a thrill and hard. The BHA yeah. could open their site up and make it the best gambling site in the world. Yeah. With all that information, free access. You get your own account, you put your own notes on, on there. It's fantastic. I mean, I mean, that's the other thing. I can remember going to a few tracks in, in America on my travels, and you, you, you were paying $5 entry fee. Yeah. On, that included a, a big full race car with form lot with form lines and speed yeah. figures and God knows what else. You know, yeah. so basically, if you were new to the sport, you'd be thinking, "Oh, what's this?" But there was actually a key in the card telling you what mm. this, this meant. And yeah. and I just think it, it, it opens avenue because at the end of the day, we don't just want people to turn up to racing and not bet. We need them to bet because that's what funds the sport. So. Having these half arse race cards that are just an absolute pilot. You get a race card in this country, Lee, and there's some mystifying ratings put in there, and half the time it's the dozy old bastard with the false teeth that sat on the hut dishing the number class out when they're coming up to free parade. And he's picking <laughs> numbers out with a flaming hat. You know. Uh, and, uh, Unbelievable. We, we got a long way to go and I, I just think other, other countries are, are just are just gonna i mean we've got the best racing calendar in the world it's the most prestigious calendar in the world in terms of it's what the breeders want to win they, 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 they forget the prize money they just love the titles of, of winning the type of races we have you know the, the the japan coronation cup or the japan coronation stakes He's not the same as our coronation. He's just got, you know, it's like winning a race in Italy. It's not, it's not the same. It's, 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 we, it's, we have the best fixture of this, but we have the worst management in the world. That's the problem. Absolutely. And you it's, know. Just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scandal. Absolute scandal. I would bet anyway. good money, Lee, good money, that if you sat five bowls of chicken soup down there and let them come up with an action plan, you would get more out of the bowls of chicken soup than you would from the 30 to 40 chinless gimps that are charged with running the game at the minute. <laughs> I can't, can't really argue with that. Right, final, final topic this week is, is the dream over for being able to bet for a living in the UK? And I, I had a private message sent to me this week, and I, I published it on Twitter from a chap that wants to remain anonymous for now. And he basically makes a nice sort of crust out of the sport, if you like. Bets on the betting exchanges. He's £115,000 up over two years. And because he's had a bit of a bad run recently, as in probably dropped about 40000 in the last three months, he got the old affordability check call from, from Betfair. And they obviously weren't satisfied with his answers that he gave on the phone, and they have put him on £1,500 deposit per month, which is equivalent to £50 a day or £400 a week. This is someone that was betting in thousands of pounds. And 
this to me is extremely worrying because I, I, gen, I genuinely feel that they're going to come for a lot of the winners. The, the Betfair ecosystem is essentially a pond where you've had the small fish and if the big fish are eating the small fish too quickly, the stocks aren't replenishing. They've had that problem for years and all of a sudden you're creating monsters without any... You, you, you're taking people's money too quickly. I understand the model, but that's the, the, the Betfair for me as an exchange on this seem to be using affordability checks as a way of getting getting rid of winners, John. This is corruption, mate. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no other way to put this. Um, and it's very, very wrong and needs sorting out double quick because it's an attack on civil liberties anyway. Somebody saying how much you can or can't deposit in a person-to-person written exchange. Um, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, as you'll say, they haven't got a leg to stand on. This account's winning. Yeah, but, you know? exactly. They yeah. have no idea what's affordable and what isn't. You know? I mean, this I, I, this I, account could have started with two quid. Yeah. He, he might not be able to afford any more than two quid. Because he got straight on and got a roll, they, they have no way of knowing that the one of them looked into it. No. It's absolutely outrageous. And it needs platforming. And somebody needs to answer some serious questions, pro- probably from the Gambling Commission, because this is, is just blowing a hole in the, in, in the entire sport. It, it's basically saying, you're not going to win at this, son, you know, um, because if you look like you're winning, we'll stop you. And that, again, comes back to the insidious gross profits tax deal where they don't want anybody winning, really. Um, they no. don't mind you just charging a shell quid as long as you're not upsetting anybody, but you'll try taking on man a couple hundred a week and they're going to have you. Well, it's not good enough. Spot on, John. Well, I mean, for me, if you'd have said this 20 years ago when Betfair and Flutter first come come about, uh, I'd be in shock now at what 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 sort of potentially we're having to do. I mean, I mean, this chap basically is going to have to set up fresh Betfair accounts, use VPNs from his probably family members' names, whatever. It's going. I mean, you're basically trying to force it. Like into into sort of black markets, into it's it's really odd. It's an odd thing to do. This affordability check should be there to protect vulnerable people and vulnerable gamblers, not an account that's that's won one hundred and fifteen thousand in two years. It's just it, it's it's an abhorrent decision. It's it's but then, but this is this is where I think we're at. I'm saying it's sinister because. This is not law. This is not... You got them on this lock. You wouldn't be, they wouldn't be able to defend the decision. No. And, and, and the, the, same, the same thing is, the, the reason I believe it's sinister is because the government have yet to release powers or, or, or make it law that, this, that they have to do this. They have taken it upon themselves to do it themselves, which means that, well, you, you, you know, you've got to make an educated decision. And, and clearly this isn't one. So... I'm viewing it as sinister for now. And I, I, if any if any listeners out there have had the same problems, please get in touch because we can get some sort of a, a movement going. I'd love to hear from all the tales. Uh, D, DM me on on Twitter or whatever, or you know whatever whatever you want to do. It, you can it'll remain private if you want it to. Um, uh, you know, but I'd like to hear of, of tales on this because as I said it, it is killing the dream. Anyone that read Clive Holt and Fine Form in the eighties. You know, when he he had an Irish coffee after after a, a thousand or sixty one, uh, heard off in the minus five degree temperatures, and he sat there with his Irish coffee with with his fat grand in his pocket, and used to read books like that and dream of making the game pay. Well, that's that's well and truly gone now. <laughs> but, sorry to put a damper on that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed our discussions uh, on the topics tonight. We're going to finish the show with. 
uh, the Jimmy Lindley section, which is the lovely pair of hands. And I know John's busting with some this week. So I'm going to let John fire away with his eye catches. I know he's got some good ones. Well, I hope they're good ones. Uh, there was a race at Windsor on Monday. Um, and they were both from the Michael Stout yard and they were both total float ups. Warhan and evaluation so busy Lizzie. Um and basically neither was ridden with any intent to, to win the race at all. Uh, I think they're both qualified for handicap marks now. Um and I'd be very surprised if we didn't see either of them winning fairly soon after going into handicaps. I would I would expect them to win first time or second time in handicap company unless they got clobbered by the handicap which they won't. Um, okay, good good stuff on that one. Um, We've got so, so I, I just before you get on to your next one, I'll, I'll just clarify so that's War ran. It ran in on the twelfth of April, two forty at Windsor. That finished second and John also likes the other Sir Michael Stout runner evaluation from that same race. So if you want to watch that video, put them in your trackers. Those are the two. And I know John's got another one, John. Yeah, there's a two-year-old race at Beverly this week. Um, Bars on as uh, David O'Meara's. Um, I messaged yourself just before the race, actually, and you did. said I thought it was an, physically it was the nicest type in the race, but it wasn't fit. Um, he actually went quite short in running this. Um, but the lack of fitness told markedly late on, he started rolling about a bit on the camber. I think this will definitely win races, probably ideally on the all weather, as I think the pedigree yeah. tends to suggest it could do with that nice supportive surface. And uh, look, I, I don't think that'll be long in winning at all. It, it wasn't fit, but that race was strained it up considerably, I think. Good stuff. And, and and by the way, listeners, I, I would I, I I always listen to John on his on his paddock stuff because I think I think he's it's a, it's an outstanding skill he's got. So whenever he's got any paddock stuff, I, I love this. So Burzon is the horse that ran on uh, the fourteenth of April, two fifteen at Beverly. He actually went tens on him running. One point one one was the shortest price matched him running, but it just absolutely hit a wall a furlong out, and obviously John felt it needed. They run quite badly in the end. So that's Boson as John's other follower. It was like that Michael Crawford character in the Michael Winner film, The Games, when he tries to run the two-hour marathon. And he just, <laughs> he just fell apart with Stanley Baker shouting at him for the last half mile. Yeah. Finished on his knees. I sad. must admit, I, I thought he had won a film now. I thought, I thought, well, this is one, but he just absolutely hit the wall of all of the, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so great, great followers there from John. I have a couple for you. Um, Tuesday the 13th of April, uh, the good old green and gold, as you like, uh, ridden by John Joe O'Neill at Southall, and it was probably one of the most disgraceful rides I've seen all season. The untouchables, they, you can't touch them. It's It literally is... Unbelievable. If this had been you know, a hurry, Henry, ridden by uh, a double barrel jockey claiming seven, they would have got uh, 40 days, big fines. It was absolutely disgraceful. It was completely not off. And it's and coming to the second, he could have won, he could, could have won the race easily. It was absolutely, you need to watch it as you like. Tuesday, 13th of April. I've got a feeling they must have had a race lined up for this. And they really didn't want to win that. It's obviously very well handicapped. It's 122. It's been in the 130s. So clearly they, they're wanting to line this up for a race. So keep your eye on that. That's as you like. And the day after, Wednesday the 14th of April, we go to Ireland, where it was Leopardstown, and a horse of Jesse Harrington's forbearance uh, ran from a very wide stall, had a really tough trip, really wide trip, Did never got any cover. Absolutely ran a race full of promise. Finished the race off full of running, surprisingly. Um, just obviously just couldn't win with, with the kind of trip it got. This is an absolute surefire winner and a decent handicap in Ireland. So watch out for forbearance. 
that ran on the Wednesday, the 14th of April, at Leopardstown. I really hope you've enjoyed the show this week. Uh, me and John have certainly enjoyed uh, doing the show, and we've enjoyed the racing this week. Hope it's been kind to you, and I hope we uh, looked after you this weekend with some winners, which, which we believe we have. And uh, we move onwards and upwards to the next show, which will be next Friday at the normal time of around uh, 7.30 GMT PM. And then we, we head to the Sunday sermon as normal next week on Sunday. So I hope you're all having a good time. You've enjoyed the show. That's all for me and John. Bye for now.